Okay, so our next pres presentation uh, is from Brian Vernal, who is a senior team leader and operations manager in the Flood Forecasting Centre, which is actually based in the Met Office uh, in Exeter. Uh, he joined the Environment Agency in 1997, initially worked in uh, the Water Resources team, and then in 2001, he started working uh, in Flood Warning as part of um, his role as a team leader there. And then following the 2007 floods that happened in the UK uh, and the subsequent government review, um, it led to the setting up of the Flood Forecasting Centre and that's uh, a part of what Brian's going to talk about today, looking at how we forecast for extreme events uh, in the UK, particularly focus on 2022 and should we export, expect more of these events in the future. So over to you Brian. Good afternoon everybody, uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, come talk to you today. Uh, I'm just going to show my screen. Get going. So, hopefully, you can now all see my screen. So, yeah. I invite to come and talk to you today. Uh, thank you for covering my career history there as well. Uh, interesting to reflect on the previous speakers we've just had that there's so much collaboration that goes on in this world. So, CEH are very much a partner of ours in what we do. Um, I started my career back in '97, as you heard. Uh, I remember some very dry chalk streams in Kent. During the 90s, we were able to walk up and down several of them. Some of that was due to over abstraction by the water companies, which I'll come on to. But it's certainly, uh, cer certainly, I've seen quite a few cycles of these weather events during my operational career. So, as Liz said, uh, I'll give you an introduction to who we are in the Flood Forecasting Centre. And also, I'm covering the Environment Agency as well today, because I'm actually employed by the Environment Agency still. So, I still have my Environment Agency hat on here today. I'll go through some of the events that we had in 2022. And then I'll cover what we're doing in the science world um, and the majority world to try and prepare ourselves better for these high impact events in the future. So who are we in the Flood Forecasting Centre? We are a working partnership between the Environment Agency and the Met Office. We're funded by DEFRA and we have a contribution as well from Welsh Government. So we cover England and Wales. We're primarily, uh, where well, we are based, down in the Met Office, down in Exeter. Uh, although a lot of it is done remotely now, as, as we're all aware. So we cover England and Wales, and we provide uh, an outlook for five days of flood risk for Category 1 and 2 responders. And I'll come on to what Category 1 and 2 responders are. So we're, we're a governance is joint from the Met Office and the Environment Agency. So we're, we're a really good example of partnership working. We're a really good example of how government departments can increasingly start working together, sharing and pooling their resource and expertise to have a common goal. So we're certainly uh, held up as a good example of um, partnership in government, and we are uh, very much uh, advocates of how much partnership working can help, because it's all taxpayers' money. We're, we're very much audited on how much money we spend. We're funded by DEFRA, who are, of course, government departments. So uh, it's all uh, your money, uh, that's uh, taxpayers' money that's paying for what we do. So we have to show a return for that. What do we do? We're 24-7. So we provide a 365 service to emergency responders. So our aims are to provide longer lead times for decision making to take action to protect communities. So we provide hydrometeorological services for the Environment Agency and Natural Resources Wales. So we're one of the first people in the world to actually now have hydrometeorologists. And it's exactly as it says on the tin. We train Met Office meteorologists in hydrology. And we equally, we take Environment Agency hydrologists and we train them in meteorology. And we actually have a nationally uh, uh, accredited rating now of hydrometeorology. So we actually have qualified hydrometeorologists. And it's something that we share internationally about how this works. So what is hydrometeorology? As Liz said earlier, when it's in the air, it's meteorology. When it's on the ground, it's hydrology. That's an easy way to think about it. So we provide flood guidance services for category one and two responders. And I'll come on to what the category one and two responder is soon. But that's that flood guidance segment that you can see there in the picture. I'll come on to what the flood guidance then is, but really that's our uh, flagship product, looking at the next five days, having a risk-based approach to county level risk for four sources of flooding. So we actually cover rivers, we cover surface water, we cover coastal, and we cover groundwater, which I'll come on to more about what they are. Like. We also increasingly do a flood outlook service after 30 days. So very much looked at the government for emergency planning and for peak periods, for example, Christmas, coming to high impact events, uh, we, we're providing a 30 day outlook as well, based on the seasonal forecast, which you also saw in the CEH presentation. We do government advisory services, 
So we're at the forefront of operational response for floods in England and Wales. We do attend COBRA. We do go as with the Met Office, we attend COBRA to provide expert SME advice, so subject matter expert advice into COBRA. And that includes briefing the Prime Minister at times uh, and writing to the heart of central government response for major events. A lot of what we do as well is improvement and engagement work, and we're also looking at training and exercises. So as I mentioned, this is our flood guidance statement. This is the example of the main storms, which I'll come on to. So this is the one that we issued out on the uh, 20th of February, 2022. So you can see we colour up the uh, counties in England and Wales by the uh, subsequent flood risk over the next five days. We also have trend arrows to show what the trend in the forecast is doing. So has it trended up or down from our previous forecast we do? We issue these once a day around half past 10 in the morning. They go out by various methods. Uh, we have something called Resilience Direct, which government responders can see. We have the Met Office Hazard Manager, where we put it on to. It's available via an API as well, so our responders can view it electronically. And of course, good old fashioned email and PDF, which is still the vast majority of people receiving it. In addition to those thumbnail maps, we include area concern maps, very uh, similar to what you've seen already for the Met Office weather warnings, which we very much work closely with, which I'll come on to. So we're using a risk-based probability approach. So as you can see, we have areas, um, polygons of risk, and you can see the area A, we were showing severe impacts as a probability. So when we're on the right-hand side of the matrix there, it's kind of the worst case scenario that we can uh, envisage from all of the ensembles that we're looking at for both the meteorology and of course the hydrology, so both of those together. It is a risk-based approach. We do use a matrix. Hopefully you're very familiar with the matrix. It's the one that the Met Office used for the weather warning service. And like I said, we're very, very closely aligned with the Met Office weather warning service. We are based in the Met Office. We uh, work very closely with the guidance unit in the Met Office and the uh, public weather service um, con civil contingencies advisors who are actually uh, issuing out those weather warnings and promoting those. So if you do see a weather warning out for precipitation, for rain, it should be matching what we're predicting as well with our forecast statement. Of course, the, the change can be when the weather's passed, but the flooding is still happening. And that's one of the reasons why we're here, because sometimes the weather all clears, the board goes clear, as we say, but there's still ongoing risk on the ground that we need to promote. So we're showing that in the flood guidance statement. So it's a risk versus uh, impact versus likelihood matrix. So as you can see on the left-hand column, we have minimal impacts, and then we move to minor impacts, significant or potentially severe. So it's very important we tell people not to just go by the current. People say, or oh, yellow warnings issued, amber warnings issued, red warnings issued. As you can see on the matrix, there's various colors of yellow. Um, you can have a medium likelihood of minor, which is pretty much a business as usual forecast, or you can have a very low likelihood of severe, probably the longer lead time. When we're up in these sorts of columns, that's when the consultancy service we're doing really kicks in, where we start telling people to be aware and start uh, thinking about the emergency plans and what's happening. Of course, though, a red is a red. A red is a high likelihood of severe impacts. So if you ever see a red, take action. Those impacts are very much based on the um, flood warnings from the Environment Agency as well. So the Environment Agency issue flood warnings when rivers are actually responding. So they're more of an operational response to a river actually responding to the rainfall with much shorter lead times. We're looking at probabilities. We're looking at five-day lead times. So we have to use probabilistic forecasting and the matrix which of course gives all those inherent problems about is the forecast right, how accurate is your forecast, etc. Um, I'm always saying to my team, there's no such thing as a wrong forecast, it's always our best uh, estimate of what's happening at the time. And the other thing to stress on our flood guidance statement as well is it's a reasonable worst case. So that's how we, we couch it for our responders. We tell them to prepare for the reasonable worst case. So probabilistically, it might not happen, but there is still some chance of it happening in the ensembles that we need to be thinking about and be aware of. So the Environment Agency as well. Uh, for those of you that don't know, it's a public body established in 1996. Uh, it is part of DEFRA. It's one of the quangos, as it was called, when it was set up. So it's non-political. It is uh, a regulatory body, and it has responsibilities for protection and enhancement of the environment in England only. It was England and Wales when it was set up, but through various devolution processes, the Environment Agency is England only now. So we're responsible for regulating all of our major industry and waste. We can treat contaminated land. We look after water quality. We look after fisheries. We look after inland river and harbour navigations. We have conservation and ecology. 
and we're also responsible for managing the risk of flooding from rivers, reservoirs, estuaries, and of course from the sea. So very wide ranging responsibilities and accountabilities across England. We're also a Category 1 responder, which I mentioned earlier. Category 1 responders are defined in the Civil Contingencies Act, and they're equal to police, fire, ambulance, all these sorts of emergency responders. So under the Civil Contingencies Act, they have, uh, they're required to assess the risk of emergencies occurring and to inform contingency plans. They are required to have emergency plans and business continuity. They're required to put place arrangements to make information available to the public in the event of an emergency, which is very important. And also showing information with responders uh, and cooperate with local, sorry, with local other local responders to enhance coordination and efficiency. Interestingly, as well, the Met Office historically had not been a Category One or Two responder, but they are currently in the process of becoming a Category Two responder, which is more about rather than the Met Office having a role on the ground with emergency response, the Category Two responder has more of a role with the warming and informing, whereas the Category One responders tend to have actual operational activity on the ground. So what happened in 2022? So you heard from Ian uh, from uh, Lincoln University, uh, very much operationally that reflects what you saw for the rainfall. So overall, fairly quiet year for flood risk. So this is a bar chart of the risk by, um, by uh, month. You can see the three known storms in February, and you can see some uh, operational activity in August. Other than that, a fairly benign year in flood risk uh, terms. We definitely have seasons for flood risk. We tend to find the winter seasons tend to be more about the frontal rain, pers uh, persistent rain, as you've heard about, causing the rivers and the main rivers to respond over that period. And also we have the possibility of the main storms and the coastal flood risk, of course. And of course, the groundwater tends to build up over the winter and groundwater can start causing flood issues. Through the summer months, we then have much short lead time events, but they tend to be the high impact convective storms. So thunderstorms coming June, July, August, September are really uh, where we have very short notice of those. We move into the now custom world. Uh, five days of warning is kind of uh, out of the current scope of what we can do for convective forecasting. We're much more focusing on the here and now within the immediate um, day of the flood risk. There's uh, a breakdown of the days of the flood risk. So you can see, as I say, you can see the main storms in there for February, and then August was the convective event over um, uh, the southeast in August. So we had the three main storms: Dudley, Unit, and Franklin. Dudley was potentially more of Scotland. Uh, we had a lot of snow melt, as you've already heard, so snow melt's a concern for us. And then Franklin brought probably the most of the impacts. The Unit primarily brought the strong winds across the UK, and we had some coastal impacts from that. Storm surge, as we're going to see about later. Uh, although there was definitely a potential for some severe impacts. Franklin brought the most rain and the snow melts, where we had some uh, really bad impacts from Manchester, Manchester and Yorkshire. And then across the Severn through Shropshire uh, and Worcestershire as well. And then the amber was the southeast thunderstorms, where we were seeing 30 to 50 millimeters in an hour, pitch over 100 millimeters in an hour over the southeast, which you don't need to tell you if you get 100 millimeters in an hour over central London. We're going to get a lot of flooding, and we heard about all the cellars in West London, potentially uh, of the houses that were flooding, and a uh, big, big disruption to those in those three there. Interesting with the name storms as well. The Met Office criteria for name storms is wind, but we do work very closely to say if there are going to be coastal impacts from uh, either surge or from spray and overtopping, we can uh, work in collaboration with the Met Office to get those storms named. And we also had Storm Christoph, which was in 2021. Which was actually named for rainfall. We had a conveyor of rain coming up into the uh, northwest. That was uh, named by the Met Office for us for rainfall, which was uh, quite, quite a, a seminal moment, really, an example of the good partnership working that we have. So I said I'd uh, cover the Environment Agency as well. So a recap of 2022, we've already seen this graph from CH. So we had six consecutive months of below average rainfall, really, for our geographical regions. The dry summer since 95, the dry summer on record in six hydrological areas, and it was the hottest summer on record in England. Interestingly, as well, for demand, water consumption was 3% higher than before COVID, and there were significant peaks for that. Well, to get through that one relatively quick, as we've heard about it from CH. What did that mean for operational response? Then? We had a rapid change in our water resources picture through the summer. By August, 11 out of 14 environment agency areas were in drought, and you've heard about how we are now, there's still two in drought as we speak, 
And that was the picture over the summer. So reservoir storage levels were down 59% of the total capacity. Public water supply usage restrictions covered 19 million people. Six water companies applied for drought permits. And we uh, environmentally issued 30 drought permits, more than any other year on record. We had 20 groundwater pumps and other transfer schemes. Abstraction restrictions. So there were 270 formal restrictions on abstraction, including water company, and over 2,000 voluntary restrictions. And we recorded more low flow environment incidents than compared to 2018. So, so some very significant um, impacts through the summer. So what are we doing about that? So uh, last year was fairly uh, benign overall for the flood risk. But on record though, 2020-12 was the late uh, spring summer, was the latest in 250 years. We've had flood flooding in Bosch Castle and Coverack, which uh, uh, was pretty exceptional things. December 2013, we had East Coast surge and uh, coastal storms. Winter 2015, we had the second wettest winter in 250 years for Storm Desmond, and we had a two 24-hour record of rainfall. And that's all before we had the wettest day on record, which was in 2020, Storm Dennis, which uh, also went into Storm Christoph as well. So each of these events have really shaped what we're thinking about. And of course, you can see in the media that uh, they are now picking up on record-breaking weather events. So what are we doing in the uh, response community to this? We're science figuring into the uh, National Security Risk Assessment. So the National Security Risk Assessment is the big overarching government assessment of national risks. Um, the highest risks uh, historically on those within the flu pandemic, so who would have thought they um, had a massive flood risk would actually come off, as you know it did. But we had coastal risk on there as well as one of the biggest risks to this country as a uh, large scale impact event. We're also now adding river and surface water flooding to that risk assessment as well with the climate change uh, agenda that we're looking at. We do think that on, on record uh, there may well be more high events that we need to do. So I'll let you, uh, you probably read that yourself now, but the flooding in Central Europe showed that climate change has increased intensity of rainfall maximums by 3 to 90 percent. The latest February record for the UK has shown that extreme rainfall is about three times more likely due to climate change. And future trends exceeding 30 mil an hour will happen more frequently by a factor of two to three by the 2070s. Howling rainfall extremes for flash flooding are expected to increase. And the unseen methodology has been applied to summer daily precipitation extremes. China for a damaging storm in July, which led to surface water flooding, increases in the daily rainfall of 50 to 100 percent of plausible. So, all things we need to plan for. So, we have the National Flood Resilience Review that we've been looking into. So, the Met Office and EA will work closely to scope and investigate the benefits of an ambitious long term approach to integrate meteorology and flood risk modeling, much more chosen. We're going to deliver this long term approach with new science and analytical techniques, and we will be encouraging the research community. To engage with the method of the environment and the development of our next generation of integrated flood risk assessments. We're going to have a step change to fully coupled uh, uh, approach to multi hazard prediction. So, uh, not just uh, using the global models, uh, using the hydrology models, using the land surface, using the sediment models, using the wave models. So, a fully coupled model is where we're moving towards. So, fully integrated in with all of the factors feeding into each other. To help us have that fully integrated model for multi hazard prediction. We're also going to have uh, fully integrated hydromet capabilities. So, uh, CEH have a model for grid to grid that we use. Um, the grid to grid model fully integrates all of the uh, uh, times and capabilities across time and space into one unified model that we're going to have uh, for the forecasting. So the benefits are uh, to capitalize on the media ensemble, uh, potentially using machine learning, is something that we're very much going to do. Um, we're going to capture the uncertainty of projected precipitation, and we're going to hopefully provide longer lead times to address those products and work on extreme worst case scenarios. So rather than just reasonable worst case, starting to think about extreme worst cases as well. So I'm just aware of the time as well, so I'll just step up this slide. So we're looking at fully integrated hydrology would also be able to enable us to have real-time inundation modeling, which is kind of the holy grail of flood forecasting. So inundations when a river comes out of the bank and where it goes basically into the flood plain. We're looking at urban scale inundation modeling for a 300 meter model. And we're going to have consistent hydrological components to enable us to have a robust comparison between the historical and future changes. 
The Environment Agency are producing the flood hydrology roadmap, which we're very much involved with in the flood forecasting centre. And we're looking at a vision for the next 25 years. So we're having a clear vision that it's going to have, uh, society will have improved information about hydrological information to manage flood hazards. Flood hydrology and the whole system process, as I've already mentioned, and also leadership and collaboration are key to uh, achieve this vision. So how are we going to prepare for the future? We're going to uh, look at the atmospheric weather and climate models that require large supercomputing facilities. So part of the excellent partnership working is we do have use of the supercomputer in the Met Office. Part of the funding case for the next generation of the Met Office supercomputer was collaboration with uh, the environment models as well. So we're very much interested in that. We're going to integrate our hydrometeorological processes to be part of an integrated modeling system. We're going to bring together the flood prediction and the water resource modeling. And we're going to have seamless flood risk forecasting across space time from minutes up to decades is the, is the ambition. Working with CEH, we have HydroJewels, which is a project which has the potential to change the nature of our hydrological modeling to ensure we're fit for the impact prediction. Uh, and we're also working internationally with this as well. But the key really is capitalize and deliver through partnerships. That's what we're doing in the space of working with the emergency responders to prepare for the uh, impacts of these future events. So the title of my talk was, should we prepare for more frequent high impact events? Yes, we should. The science is there, the evidence is clear that we're, as I just showed you, that we're going to have these high impact events happening more frequently in the future. So we're encouraging our emergency response community to be prepared for that. So it's hope for the best, um, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. So you need to be able to respond to multiple high impact events. So they could be differing events from the winter flooding, which can be sustained over multiple communities, which is the one that affects you know, thousands of people, to the summer thunderstorms where they're very intense and uh, very localized, but can be very high impact as well. But of course, I think it is. Hopefully that will come across okay. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Brian. A, a really good look behind the scenes, I guess, of the work of the uh, Flood Forecasting Centre and that important partnership between the Environment Agency and the Met Office. So thank you for that. Any questions for Brian, please pop it in the Q&A. Uh, and while I'm waiting for some questions, I, I, I'm just interested to know um, in the kind of strategy and the looking at kind of future developments, how much kind of social science comes into this because it's all very well having you know excellent science and warnings but if people don't take action to those warnings then you know we, we could lose life and and obviously um you know just just the support to people so i just wondered how much social science comes into all of this increasingly lots and lots and lots you may know helen roberts my colleague in the method who's uh, looking into this field very much and we're working very much with helen um closely tied into the Met Office as well. What do people do with a warning? So we're aimed at capital one and two responders. So if it was a public, and we say it's going to happen in a dozen, you start to lose the faith and you start to say, well, we're going north. Um, increasingly, we're looking at the public warning being short notice. So I mentioned about thunderstorm warnings. They need to be something that's short notice within six hours. Similar. So we're not really in the FFC, we're not really in the realm of um, public warning and informing, but we are doing lots of social science to actually do what do people do. And the environment agency are actually now going live with their uh, broadcast warning networks. So now we're going to ping into people's mobiles in an area. So the stuff that's real danger to life is the stuff that's going to ping on your mobile and tell you, you know, there's a risk to life, you need to take action. And you need to be very, very careful how you use that. Because if we issue risk to life warnings and there is no risk to life, people will start not taking action. So it's certainly a space we're moving into, social science, and it's fascinating. Isn't it? Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. And is there a different approach when we get flooding events in, in different kind of river valleys? So in, in the steep river valleys that you might get in, say, South Wales, um, where you get, I mean, the, I guess you get the more flash floods happening, things happen very quickly. And I guess it's very challenging to get warnings out and messages out well in advance compared to the kind of the gentler sloping rivers where, you know, you, you could be warning quite comfortably days in advance as you watch that that uh, excess water going down river. How, how, how's the approach different for those different types of river valleys? Really good question. So it's actually what hydrometeorology is all about. So uh, it's the problem was before us, you had the same rainfall, but you didn't know what the catchments were. So you weren't able to model that. Yeah. We never do model that. So you get rain in the Welsh mountains, it floods the River Severn five days later. Um, you get rain in the flashy uh, valley, uh, it will rain instantaneously. Bush Castle happens in half an hour. 
So we do have a different approach to those, uh, and the environment types do sometimes as well issue uh, warnings based on rainfall declarations. So they have to bring in upper catchments on the real flashy catchments. But of course, it's a risk-based approach. What we look at is what's the actual risk in that community. So if it's a rural valley with not much um, people and infrastructure, we won't be warning and informing for that. But if it's a rural valley with cardiff sat at the bottom, then it's very much more about uh, what we think about. So we do factor in um, the risk uh, of, of the impacts. So it's an impact space assessment. So how many people are going to flood? And that would be how, how quickly we get those warnings as well. Great, thank you. Uh, and Edmund just asked the the flood stripes that you showed for 2022 is a really good visual way of kind of showing uh, the flood warnings. Um, is there somewhere that you can look over a range of previous years, so multiple years, uh, on a UK based or sub region kind of level? Uh, we can. We have, we have our data going back to 2009 when we started. Yeah. Um, it's publicly available if people want it. Uh, we have a website. So if you just Google flood forecast and center, you'll see. Uh, an email address you can you can request that data from us. Um, but yeah, it's really good. We have a guy in our team who's really into that visualization. We started just using the chat GPT thing. So yeah, yeah and we started developing scripts to do all the even turbulent stuff. So <laughs> it's a great visualization tool. The guy in my team who loves it and uh, I'm trying to do more and more of it. Brilliant. Okay, well thank you very much, Brian. Um you'll be joining us obviously for the question and answer later on. So if there are any further questions for Brian, then we can we can come back to those then. Brilliant. Thank you.